everyone. I'm James Milan, and welcome to Talk of the Town. Uh, and I have to say, I've been looking forward to this uh, episode for a while. We are going to uh, talk both from a big picture perspective and then, then dig into some of the details of the net zero action plan that was just, um, you know, unveiled basically after a year and a half at least of intensive work by a number of people in town. And we're getting to talk to the experts about this, um, with, who include uh, the director of our Department of Planning and Community Development, Jennifer Rate, and also Ken Pruitt, who is our town's energy manager and who spearheaded uh, the group of folks who have been working so hard to generate uh, this action plan. So um, welcome to you both. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you for Pleasure having us. Here. Um, and let me ask uh, you, uh, Jennifer, if you wouldn't mind to just start us off uh, situating um, this action plan uh, within the larger context of uh, what's been going on in Arlington, what's going on on the state level, et cetera. Uh, and then perhaps a, a little bit later, we can dive in with Ken more into the details. Absolutely. So um, I'll start by saying that Arlington has long strived towards sustainable planning and sustainability in general. Um, in 2000, Arlington joined the UN-sponsored Cities for Climate Protection. And by 2005, uh, Arlington actually adopted its first climate action plan, which was dubbed the Arlington Sustainability Action Plan, which by the way is ASAP, which is a really cool acronym that I think everybody should emulate. <laughs> um, you know, that is really what we were trying to do back in 2005, which is to urgently address issues of climate resiliency and climate change and adaptation. And so, the, you know, it really demonstrates that the community has long been thinking about this issue. Um, and that plan actually had called for a 10% reduction in greenhouse gas pollution by 2010 and 20% 20 by 2020, uh, based on data that was available at that time. In 2010, uh, we actually had a municipal pledge to meet five energy and climate com uh, commitments. And Arlington at that time was then designated a green community by the State Department of Energy Resources. And we've maintained that status since that time. Uh, netting millions of dollars uh, to address uh, energy efficiency goals in the community, uh, particularly around town-owned properties. Um, and Ken, of course, can talk a little bit about that based upon his work. Um, but really, what I, what I want to demonstrate is just that it, this has really been an issue that the community has long been striving towards and, lo and long been hoping would be addressed, I think, beyond Arlington, really at the state level and the federal level as well. So many people in the community have been working on this issue for quite a long time. Um, and additionally, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more recently, about five or six years ago, Arlington became a member of more sort of regional solutions working through the Metropolitan Area Planning Council's Metro Mayors Coalition, of which Arlington is a member community. There have been actually a couple of different regional initiatives that Arlington plays a role on, very uh, you know, strategic for both the town's goals, but also to address regional issues that have an impact on this community. Um, and those include the Climate Preparedness Task Force, which uh, Ken is a member of, as well as Emily Sullivan uh, with the town manager. Um, and then also a number of resiliency initiatives that I think are important to note, uh, which of course relate to climate resiliency, not just net zero. And those include initiatives that are led by our Mystic River Watershed Association, as well as the Charles River Watershed Association. So we've really tried very hard to work on this issue, not just as a community, but working with our neighbors uh, throughout the region. And um, a couple of years ago, the select board voted to become net zero by 2050. And that's what really drove us, the department, of course, working with the Clean Energy Future, uh, Clean Energy Future Committee. <laughs> I almost said something else and I don't know what it was, <laughs> but I was coming up with a new acronym hey, for a community <laughs> committee. Strung um, a lot of words so, together well so far. So, you know. So many acronyms. Um, the CEFC embarked on this planning process uh, which was really supported in part by a technical assistance grant that we received from the from MAPC. And that was really to reach that net zero goal. So that's the plan that you know we've been talking about and, and promoting, but it's taken a it's taken some time to put together, in part because of the pandemic, but also in part because we really wanted to drill down to create local 
relevant actions that would make sense for the community, but also would have a really broad impact. And so uh, the town, you know, really decided that there would be basically three big categories that we would focus on about uh, buildings, uh, transportation, and sort of the mobility network, and then of course, clean energy. And uh, that really, Ken can speak to these in much, much greater detail, of course, but it's really five key things. Making our homes and buildings more, much more efficient, uh, electrifying heating and cooking, electrifying transportation, helping people to drive less by giving them better options in the community, and producing more renewable energy, potentially locally. So those five things are really uh, in, in great detail outlined in the Net Zero Action Plan, which we've now got in place and which we hope to achieve by 2050. Of course, Arlington can't do it alone. Um, and as I've outlined, we never thought we could do it alone. We've been working on this as a region um, and playing a very active role in that. And so I think that there's a couple of really remarkable things that are going on right now that are showing us that there's some promise that we won't be going at it alone. One of them is that the next generation roadmap was signed into law last week by Governor Baker. This is the long anticipated bill to address climate change in climate change in Massachusetts. Um, and this is in the 13 years since the Massachusetts, uh, the, the Commonwealth became part of the Global Warmer, Warming Solutions Act of 2008. Um, you know, really a lot has evolved and, and changed. And I think that as I noted in our prior segment, a lot of people are pressing for urgency to really uh, cement very clear solutions to get us to 2050 or even sooner um, to address these issues. So this is really something that's been going on for a while at the state level, but just this past week, we saw that this was signed into law, which is very exciting uh, because it does a number of things, you know, including updating and strengthening the stretch building energy code, which will actually state something about net zero, which it currently does not and allow local communities to opt into a net zero building code. Um, it also provides very clear protections for people who are living in what are called environmental justice communities. There's actually over 7,000 Arlington residents who live in these types of communities or about 17% of our total population. So we actually have a number of, of people right now in Arlington who, who deserve and require additional protections. And so not just through the net zero action plan, but now through this um, next generation roadmap, we'll see more solutions geared towards those communities, not just in Arlington, but across the state. And then lastly, it's providing renewable portfolio standards to add really much more significant renewable power in the system. And I think that that's really, that's, that's key to everything because we, we really can't do it without more clean energy, energy sources. Um, and that of course goes back to a number of other uh, bigger picture regional compacts that we are part of uh, throughout New England um, that I think are really gonna show a lot of promise in the coming years, especially now that we have this bill signed. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna mention that at the federal level, we just learned that um, well, after, after four years of waiting for a federal transportation bill and infrastructure bill to be signed into law, uh, we now see that there is some momentum to sign an infrastructure bill into law, trillions of dollars uh, bill potentially, to address very significant issues in our infrastructure system throughout this country. And one of them I think will be uh, probably a lot of the funds will go towards uh, both clean energy and renewables, as well as uh, to addressing issues of climate change and resiliency as part of our infrastructure network. And that includes uh, sewer, water, our transportation system itself, um, and a lot of other areas of, you know, bridges, dams. I mean, there's there's so many things that require significant monetary um, support in order to become much more resilient in the future. So, all this said, um, I'm really excited that Arlington has adopted this local plan, and that we have something in place to really help us to move forward together. Because I think that you know it has to be done at the local level. It can't just be we can't be waiting for the state. We certainly can't be waiting for the federal government to act. We do have to take some actions locally, but at the same time, in the bigger picture, I think there's a lot to do uh, to support these state level goals and of course to advocate for federal support to move forward. Um, so with that, I think it would be helpful perhaps to hear more about some of the local level things that we're gonna be pursuing um, from Ken, unless of course you have questions.
Well, I, I, I do, uh, you know, I, I do want to just ask, Ken, uh, if you wouldn't mind starting in one particular place, because um, what what Jenny was saying there, um, there's so much information in what she in, in what she presented to us there. But I am uh, struck in particular by a couple of things. One, that great acronym that she mentioned at the, near the beginning, ASAP, which is now many years old, right? And so there is has been that sense of urgency. Uh, for a long time in our community. Great to hear that, first of all, you know, more and more people are, are obviously feeling that way, um, but um, but also that we are finally beginning to take action uh, in a way that hopefully people will uh, get behind um, it, it very kind of uh, strenuously and, and with and with and devotedly so that we can really make these things happen. Um, but uh, what I wanted to ask you, Ken, is uh, Jenny mentioned six, uh, I mean five goals, excuse me, and what struck me in among those is the centrality of electrification to virtually all of the four of the five goals. Um, the last of which, of course, Jenny has already said herself, is the key to everything, which is expanding renewable energy resources that we can tap into. And that's my question, that's where I'd like you to start, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, with the fact that am I right in thinking that everything else that we want to do depends on us being able to tap into electricity and substitute it for other forms of energy um, in a way that is clean and better for the environment and for ourselves? Well, that's ex exactly right, James. And uh, you know, this this is let me just first say an, actually an exciting time to be working in the area of climate. You know, Jenny did an outstanding job of providing the overall context and the, the sense of momentum that we have um, at the federal level for the first time in a while, um, at the state level with the most consequential climate bill to pass since the Global Warming Solutions Act, as Jenny mentioned back in 2008, uh, and to be working in a town that is, you know, one of the most forward-leaning uh, active communities on climate in the entire state, and Massachusetts is, uh, I think, uh, among the top two or three states taking action on climate in the country. So this is uh, this is part of what you know uh, attracted me to working in Arlington. It's really a remarkable place to be for all those reasons. Um, and now to your specific question about electrification, it's one that is really important and that um, most people don't know about, haven't thought about, um, and may seem confusing because energy is energy. Uh, people point out, well, why is electricity so great? It's A lot of it is produced by natural gas. And um, the reason uh, there's such a focus on electrification in the net zero action plan, and indeed in the climate bill that just passed the legislature, is that um, if we can convert all energy uses um, to uh, powered by electricity uh, and then produce that electricity from renewable sources like solar and wind, right there you've achieved net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Essentially, we have to stop burning things. Uh, and that's how, we, that's how we stop sending carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, and uh, you know, at present, uh, there's a substantial portion of our electricity that's already coming from non-emitting sources. And a lot more is coming. We have quite a bit of uh, hydropower is scheduled to come from Quebec. Um, it's, that's still being worked on in terms of the transmission lines. And we actually have a huge amount of electricity um, coming very soon from offshore wind. Again, something that most Massachusetts residents are, are kind of unaware of, but um, we the, the first installment of um, about 1,600 megawatts of offshore wind is coming within the next five years. It's going to power over 400,000 Massachusetts homes, and that's just the first installment of what will become, thanks to this bill that Jenny mentioned, um, the Next Generation Roadmap, um, a total of 5,600 megawatts of offshore wind. So just almost unthinkable amounts of completely carbon-free electricity, which, by the way, will create a lot of jobs in the process. So the trick then becomes, at the local level, um, how do you number one, convey the importance of electrifying everything, but then number two, help people do it. Um, 
because you know um, you know people um, you know need to drive to get places um, if they're not biking or taking buses um, or walking, which we highly recommend and is also part of the net zero plan. But even someone motivated to buy an electric vehicle, there's there's still a learning curve. What kind of vehicles? Um, what are their ranges? How can you charge them? Um, you know, what if you don't have a garage or a driveway to put in your own charging station? A lot of questions around that. Um, and then if you are heating your home with oil uh, or gas, which is extremely likely in Arlington, um, how do you uh, convert that to an all electric use, which is almost certainly gonna be a heat pump. And part of the way that uh, we're addressing that in the net zero plan was to acknowledge fully that this is confusing and complex and a lot of education needs to happen, and a lot of support. And so um, one of the top measures uh, in the plan is to create an Electrify Arlington campaign and associated uh, website which will provide people with um, information they need um, in a variety of settings and up to and including, we hope, uh, volunteer energy coaches, uh, which could sort of guide people through the process of determining what kind of electric car might be right for them or whether their home is suitable for a heat pump, whether they need to insulate their home and air seal it first. Um, there's a lot to think about and it's somewhat different from the way we've all done things for a very long time. And so the plan uh, isn't sort of just setting targets and mandates. It's really about helping people to, to do the right thing. Um, and uh, the Electrify Arlington campaign is going to be a key, uh, key component to that. Yeah, I mean, that sounds – It's how, you guys know. I'm excited about this <laughs> um, uh, for sure. But what I, what I absolutely love about what you were just saying and what both of you have said – is that we are moving to action here that you are that you are putting in place um processes that people will be able to whether they're educational processes or operational processes people are going to uh if they are interested first of all i guess you need to make sure that you spur that interest um but once people are interested and we live in a town full of people who it seems are going to be um then you've you're you're providing uh, a pathway, uh, you know, an, an actual concrete pathway for people to be able to do that. Um, I'm intrigued by one thing you just said about potentially, you know, part of the plan, and I, I'm sure they're not in place yet or anything like that, but would be to have kind of like counselors, basically, people who could, uh, who um, residents could reach out to uh, in some form who could consult with them, answer their questions, but also like provide uh, specific guidance around particular projects uh, that those residents might be interested in. It, it, do I have that right? That's that, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's crucial because uh, you know we we'll we'll do our best. Um, in fact, we're already doing some research on materials to include in an Electrify Arlington um, website. Um, because a lot of people, you know, will, will take the initiative and they'll read up on what they need to do. But again, because this, so much of this is new uh, to most people and because it is still fairly complex and, you know, even, even HVAC installers, even your typical, you know, furnace installer may be somewhat unfamiliar with heat pumps, for example, and may have always been installing, you know, gas furnaces, uh, that it's, there's some, there's some inertia um, and some momentum that we kind of have to shift direction in. There's some education and there's also just, you know, some trepidation when people are thinking about making a big like, expense, a big purchase like a car or a furnace and among other things, don't want their home to, to get freezing cold in the middle of the winter. They need some, some reassurance that, that uh, they're making the right decisions. And this is where, you know, the, the fair, pretty large number of Arlington residents who have already done these things and are passionate about them and willing to help. As we saw actually with our Heat Smart campaign, we pulled together a lot of volunteers and they um, spent a lot of hours uh, doing that exact, exactly that kind of coaching and um, you know support for residents to to switch over to heat pumps or or uh, sol solar hot water that type of thing. Um, that we can continue that and give people 
the information they need, but also the reassurance and, and guidance um, for something that will be new to them. I understand that, you know, it, it would be unfair, it feels like, to ask you to, you know, delineate specific points on this timeline. But if you wouldn't mind talking about the timeline itself, what is what are the first things that you're expecting to put into place around the action elements um, in the plan, uh, including mm -hmm. among the things that you've already mentioned are going to be, you know, you, you're, you're either currently working on or soon to be working on? Right. Uh, well, I can say the first part is easy. We've we've already already actually implemented one of the measures in the plan, which was the fossil fuel bylaw that passed um, last uh, November, and which included both uh, a bylaw restricting new connections for um, fossil fuels and heating systems um, in buildings, and uh, included a home rule petition, which is about to be filed at the legislature. Uh, granting Arlington the authority to have such a bylaw, which technically um, communities don't, uh, based on three different state laws. Um, so that that actually that measure already straight out of the plan um, did pass the last town meeting. At this upcoming town meeting, there'll be another measure from the plan, which is a measure to uh, eliminate a barrier in the zoning bylaw to um, putting in uh, new uh, super insulated building foundations on non-conforming lots, um, essentially just eliminating, you know, incentives to do the right thing are important, but we should at least eliminate, you know, hard barriers to doing the right thing. And in this case, you know, to build, to renovate your home, to make it net zero um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, it's hard to do so without a, a well-insulated basement. And a lot of basements in Arlington are older and leaky and crumbling and it makes it very hard to do that so this this would if this passes a town meeting it would be the second measure from the plan to already um, uh, be enacted after that um, I do think the electrify Arlington campaign will come early again we're already doing some some research on the website for that um, and it is it is so kind of foundational to what we're hoping to achieve with the the overall electrification angle uh you know focus of the net zero plan <clears throat> after that it's a little more difficult to say there's going to be a process involving both uh, the members of the clean energy future committee uh discussing what their prior priorities are and how much we can take on in a given year uh you know coupled with my own um consultations with jenny and with the rest of the department of planning and community development uh, because we are, you know, the primary staffers to this committee, and we have to make sure that we can, you know, successfully implement these measures while also doing everything else that our department does, uh, which is which is considerable. Um, so, you know, it it's difficult to say exactly what we'll take on, um, you know, for the rest of the year, this year and going forward. But I I do think the Electrify Arlington campaign will come early, because it, as you said, James, it it kind of enables um, a lot of other measures in the plan to be possible. Yeah, and Jenny, I wanted to ask you yeah. um, as well, uh, you know, invite either of you or both to respond to this. And that is, Ken's already mentioned the kind of challenge that we'll be educating folks, but what do you guys see as the as the biggest obstacles or, or, or challenges, however you want to put it, um, mm -hmm. as as we move forward into, you know, the initial actions and then further ones from there. Mm -hmm. Jenny, I think you were about to say something, so go ahead. Yeah, I was going to add on to what uh, Ken was talking before, about before, about the next steps in the process. So one is the, the net zero action plan actually does have timelines embedded into the various uh, strategies that are outlined in the plan. But I wanted to talk about uh, a couple of things that I think are very important. One of them is this really overlaps, the mobility section in particular overlaps quite substantially with the Connect Arlington plan, which is our, uh, you know, the sustainable transportation, long range transportation plan for, for Arlington. Um, in that, you know, we, if we want to provide alternative modes of transportation and particularly comfortable and efficient and reliable ones, um, we need to do some work on our existing network in Arlington. So a number of things that are in the Connect Arlington plan speak to that. And the Net Zero Action Plan, actually the first item is really to support the initiatives that are outlined in the, in the Connect Arlington plan, because they're really 
fundamental. I mean, we cannot just focus on electric vehicles, although that is substantively very important to the goals of the net zero plan. It can't just be that. It also has to provide for safe and reliable and efficient uh, other alternative modes of transportation in order to be better in the future as a community and, frankly, as part of the network in the region. Um, we have the Minuteman Bikeway, but we have a lot of other uh, possibilities in terms of really enhancing the network, um, particularly for safe biking, um, walking opportunities, and, you know, and other things as well, which are outlined in Connect Arlington. Um, and then I would say on the on the other end is the sort of building environment, where I actually think that there's really a lot more that we can do well beyond um, some of the, um, even some of the things that are outlined in the net zero plan. And a lot of those things are gonna come out of, frankly, the roadmap that I mentioned that was just uh, adopted by the governor's office, where there's the net zero stretch, uh, stretch code, which I think we'll definitely want to consider uh, opting into locally. And then a lot of other opportunities, including other forms of construction that I think we want to really incentivize, which includes things like Passive House, um, other higher and even better standards beyond LEED, um, which is something that the community has supported since the 90s. Um, so I think you know there's, there's really a lot there that I think a number of people, both on the redevelopment board and certainly in the community, are very interested in. And I would say that that'll become likely a high priority. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't answer your other question. No, 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 no actually, you did in, in, in some ways, in that okay. you're, you're saying that uh, what I heard what I heard was that the Dead Zero Action Plan is going to um, dovetail with and intersect with a number of other kinds of initiatives that are either already underway or you're, you're planning to push, um, such that we get this kind of symbiotic effect, one hopes, uh, of all these things working together going forward. So. In, in a sense, I asked a, a hard question, which is, what are the obstacles you foresee? Uh, and you answered with a, you know, I thought a, a pretty kind of uh, optimistic or, or at least uh, hopeful uh, scenario going forward, and, but also one that seems to me well within reason. Um, Ken, I don't know if you want to address, uh, you know, the question on the obstacle side or 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 at just at, add anything to what uh, Jenny said, but please, please do jump in. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I would say, first of all, Jenny's exactly right. The top mobility measure in the net zero plan is actually to support strongly, for the CEFC to strongly support um, full implementation of the Connect Arlington plan, um, because it isn't just about switching people to electric vehicles, but making it easier for them not to feel that they need their own personal vehicle at all. Um, so that is key. I would say, in terms of in terms of obstacles, um, I think electric vehicle adoption over time uh, right now seems hard, but I think it's going to get easier and easier. So I'm actually not that worried about our ability um, as a society or even as a town to to move to electric vehicles. I think it's moving inexorably in that direction and, and at an accelerated pace. A um, number of major U.S. auto manufacturers have said they're just going to stop producing internal combustion engine vehicles because they can see that the future is with EVs. And so, they'll, you know, there are, there are things that we can do, and th those things are in the plan to kind of promote um, a faster shift to electric vehicles. But the shift is is absolutely coming. Um, all analysts looking at it um, agree with that. Uh, and uh, you know, as Jenny mentioned, with the new um, opt-in stretch code that's coming from um, the roadmap climate bill that just passed the legislature, uh, it, that should allow communities to make new construction and major renovations um, highly efficient and net zero. What remains is what I see as the biggest challenge. Um, older existing housing stock um, with fossil fuel heating systems. Uh, it is at present uh, difficult and sometimes expensive to convert those existing structures to uh, all electric structures. Um, and that that is where we, we I think, will need a combination of a number of things, most importantly, state incentives um, to to you know rebates and that type of thing for heat pumps, but um, also some improvements in technology. Um, you know, I would love to see a, a drop-in solution 
for uh, furnaces or boilers where you may you can maintain your radiators, for example, and not have to to put in a whole new duct system, for example, in your house, and just replace your furnace with a heat pump version that generates hot water or um, or hot air for your for your um, existing heating system. That would be that technological improvement would be a game changer because then you wouldn't have to uh, go through what what is currently a much more complex and sometimes expensive process. So, I think the my, the biggest area where we have um, we'll have a lot of work to do is in the area of heating and cooling for existing older buildings. I'll just yeah. um I'll add to that if you don't mind um because I I think you Ken really talked about a very important point that's an area where it's both a barrier but there's so many opportunities for innovation that I'm really excited to see what will come out of building technology and materials I think is really fascinating actually um, and there's some really I mean, we, we're, we're in the neighborhood of lots of really great educational institutions that are already thinking about building technology and building materials mm -hmm. of the future. And so there's some really interesting things happening, but the manufacturing, the, you know, the, the production of those materials, and then how quickly those materials can actually be uh, generated to be able to be put into new homes and, uh, you know, facilitate new construction that is uh, both renewable and sustainable remains to be seen. Um, but I think actually there's some really fascinating opportunities in building technology that I'm very excited about. But right now it's a huge barrier, uh, particularly for uh, smaller scale development of which basically that is what we mostly have in Arlington. So in other words, the you know 10 or fewer residential units. A lot of what we see in Arlington is actually that type of building um, where there might be some, you know, uh, in mixed use structures or even just uh, smaller residential developments, those are actually much harder to align with these newer technologies right now. They're still not the right technology in place. So I think we need some, we need to do some more work there for sure. But I think that we're, we're going to see some very interesting innovations emerging as a result of new policy coming into place. That, that always, that's what comes next is innovation. Um, the other thing that I think is a real barrier, but also an opportunity is the community's infrastructure. We actually have to really, you know, we're we're fighting against a hundreds, hundreds of years of setting up our community to be accommodating to cars. Um, and, but actually like a specific type of car as, as Ken noted. So that uh, really will take some change, both in terms of how we look at our streets and systems, but also how we install technology in neighborhoods potentially to help with, uh, you know, uh, allowing people to charge vehicles in maybe neighborhood stations uh, that are in neighborhoods, not just along our main areas or in, you know, um, parking lots, et cetera, and, you know, municipal places. Uh, but then we, we have some big barriers regionally, like the Me Amelia Ar Earhart Dam um, and a, a number of other sort of, I would say, big infrastructure ticket items that need to be addressed that are actually really in the way of sound long-term resiliency for our region, um, not just net zero, but just more broadly resiliency. Um, so that, that would be another thing. And then lastly, you know, I think one real miss, uh, unfortunately, I have to say something uh, that I think is, is a barrier that goes uh, beyond Arlington, but the state no, still needs to do more to focus on you know, improved land use and transit opportunities. And the next generation roadmap could have gone a little bit further to address this and really discouraging certain types of land use that is not happening in Arlington, but is happening in some of our other communities, uh, you know, beyond that have much more land and valuable land to develop. Uh, um, and developing in those locations is ultimately bad in the long term. So I do think we need to have some more policies for around land use that discourage that type of development. And then related to that is we really need more uh, investment in our transportation infrastructure. Without that, we can talk for a very long time about transportation alternatives, but if we don't fund them and we don't make them more reliable, it really won't matter in the long term and we'll still be driving. And I think we all know that we, we do have to drive to get to lots of places, but if we can put in place reliable alternatives in the future, that'll make a big difference. And we have until 2050 to plan this out. So <laughs> I'm very hopeful that by then we will definitely be able to hop on the bus or get on our bike to make those short trips that we all make every day without having to rely on a vehicle. Yeah. I mean, as you 
as you said so well, uh, you know, there's <laughs> there's more than enough talk. There is more than enough talk about the MBTA, about our transportation system in general, about changing our streets, et cetera, uh, and precious little action um, so far in the time that I've been paying attention over these last 10, 15, 20 years, I got to say. So hope that you are uh, right on that. Love what you said about uh, being optimistic and even excited and you could tell about building technology uh, innovations coming, you know, on the horizon, hopefully around the corner, because uh, as I know you both know, and and maybe members of our audience, I've, you know, I've, I'm a homeowner here in Arlington who's on the path uh, towards what you're talking about. And Ken, I know you said uh, it's complicated, complex, and sometimes expensive. Well, I'm not sure when it isn't expensive, but I can <laughs> attest to the fact that, you know, in our case, moving, um, you know, again, our heating system to incorporate heat pumps, et cetera, it was expensive. It was an investment. It was something that we needed to do because we thought it was the right thing to do. Um, and not just because it would be, it would save us money over the long term, et cetera, we hope. Um, and so, again, we are representative of lots and lots of people in Arlington with that kind of attitude. But I think making things clearer um, and over time uh, easier and less expensive to make those changes uh, will be a, a remarkable accomplishment and, and, and really, you know, affect the quality of life of lots of folks here in Arlington. Uh, last thing I want right. to ask you about, and again, I invite either of you to, or both to respond. Jenny, you've spoken about this. Both of you have alluded to it, and Benny, Jenny, you spoke to it quite a bit already, but um, the, the relationship specifically between the Net Zero Action Plan here in Arlington and regional cooperation or action that we are part of or are going to be promoting, um, what is that relationship? Is it built into the plan to, um, you know, to uh, kind of strengthen our existing uh, regional relationships around that um, or build new ones? Or is that something that's going to be happening parallel to the plan rolling out uh, here in Arlington? Well, I think it's fundamental to the plan and to many of the other plans that we're talking about. Our town manager is uh, incredibly supportive and, uh, and enthusiastic about this plan and many of the others that we're working on. And it's also really instrumental to us working regionally. Um, on these solutions as re really also statewide um, in his various initiatives. But uh, Ken participates really in some of those more regional discussions uh, with the Metro Mayor's Coalition. So I'll let him, you know, maybe speak to what that means more on the ground related to the uh, Climate Preparedness Task Force, for example. Right, yeah, the, the Climate Preparedness <clears throat> Task Force of the Metro Mayor's Coalition um, is you know, it's Boston and 14 surrounding communities, the, the staff from those communities. And, you know, what's beneficial is we share ideas. If someone has a good idea in one community, um, the rest of us hear about it. Um, if there's an appropriate grant program um, that, that we can take advantage of for one or more of our initiatives, um, we all hear about it. And that is super helpful. Sometimes we also um, discuss, you know, more regional projects um, that we could do. You know, we the the Heat Smart campaign that we ran a couple of years ago was both for Arlington and Winchester, and that gave us some great economies of scale, great collaboration uh, between the two communities. Um, and now, a number of the people involved with that initiative are working on kind of a permanent Heat Smart coalition of kind of all the communities who've ever done Heat Smart in the state going forward. Um, you know, the the Net Zero plan itself does call for um, working uh, with our legislative delegation and with, um, you know, willing partners in other communities to help influence the legislature, because so much of what we do need to do can be uh, greatly facilitated by changes in state law. You know, this this the climate bill that just passed, um, the fact that it includes um, an opt-in net zero stretch code could be a real game changer. Uh, frankly, if that had passed a couple of years ago we probably wouldn't have even seen the need to go for a, 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 a bylaw change um, to, uh, to, to phase out uh, new fossil fuel connections um, in buildings because that would have been taken care of by this new building code. 
Um, so, uh, you know, the, there are certain things that I think we can do just within the community, certain things that are facilitated working with, you know, surrounding communities and small coalitions. Um, and then and then others where when we can influence uh, either alone or in coalition state law, I can really facilitate what we need to do here. You know, I uh, like to uh, offer this option as often as possible, and I'm always surprised <laughs> Uh, how often somebody takes me up on it and there's good stuff in it and that is just to ask you invite you you know we've we kind of set out what we were going to talk about before we go on air and uh, and you guys have you know certainly we have been chatting for a while here it's a long uh, talk of the town episode but I think one well worth uh, viewers uh, sticking with all the way through but I wanted to finish by asking or inviting both of you to add anything in uh, that we have uh, either talked about insufficiently or not enough, not at all, uh, and, and needs mentioning before we sign off. Um, if I, yeah, if I may go, uh, I think the there are a couple of things that that um, Arlington residents can do right now to have a significant impact on reducing their carbon footprint, um, and they are. Uh, part of the net zero plan, but you don't have to wait for the Electrify Arlington campaign to reach you. Um, one of them is that we have the Arlington Community Electricity Program in town, um, and everyone is automatically enrolled in this program. It's it's a um, you get the same electricity through um, the same uh, uh, power lines, and you pay your EverSource bill, but the source of that electricity is greener. So we by participating in the ACE um, program, which we all do, you automatically get an 11% more clean electricity than required by law. But you can also opt up to either 50% or 100% clean electricity in about three or four minutes by going to the town's website, ace.arlingtonma.gov. Um, just grab your Eversource bill. That's the only thing that you need to have in front of you other than what you already have in your head. You know your name, address, so on and so forth. Put in the EverSource account number, click on opting up to 50 or 100 percent clean electricity, and that uh, that will you know me that means that all the electricity you're using in your home is from clean sources, and that has that has a big impact. There's a small additional cost. Average uh, Arlington home would pay about 15 dollars a month more for electricity at the 100 percent clean electricity level. So definitely you know be aware of that and, and choose accordingly. But for those kind of chomping at the bit to, to do what they can, um, opting up uh, in Arlington community electricity to 50 or 100% um, is an easy, quick thing to do that will have a big impact. Great. So glad you mentioned that, in fact. And again, here I am, Arlington, typical Arlington resident. Um, you know, four bedroom house, two and a half baths, that's where we live. Uh, and Ken, you're right. I can say now after being at 100% for more than a year, um, it's about $15. It's about 15 to $18 more that, that we're paying. I actually looked, so um, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, Jenny, anything to add? Yeah, just to say that, um, or just to underscore something I said earlier, which is we have an, a very enthusiastic and supportive community when it comes to the <laughs> realizing these goals. And I'm, I very much appreciate that. But I also wanna recognize that a number of our elected officials, including our delegation um, at the state level has really, you know, they've also been very instrumental in addressing the issues that are beyond Arlington, because I do think that the two really relate to one another. We can do, so we can take certain actions independently and certainly on our own or as a community but we really do need to rely upon the state for a number of bigger, you know, heavier lifts uh, to reach these goals to 2050 or maybe hopefully sooner. Um, and then of course the pressure on the federal government, you know, comes from our uh, con congressional representation, which is also um, amazing and really critical to realizing those bigger picture goals, but also the funding for them, um, not just the policy piece, but also the money to make them happen. I think with all of these things combined, we're really set up for success. And I'm just very excited to be part of that process and to see what comes next. Well, once again, I am very glad that I asked uh, you both whether uh, there was anything else to add, because both of those were, were absolute gems um, in terms of 
uh, additional information or acknowledgement uh, in the case of uh, Jenny, you're certainly right. Uh, we would have been remiss indeed to have this whole long conversation and not mention the efforts of our of our local legislators. Um, so thank you both uh, very much. I want to, uh, first of all, congratulate you, congratulate you both, particularly you, Ken, because I know, again, it, it was, I don't think it's a, um, I don't think I'm overstating it to say it was a prodigious amount of effort uh, to come up with this plan. And, um, and it is one uh, which is really literally going to have an impact uh, on all of the people who live in our town um, and for years to come. So that's quite a responsibility. Um, and I know that you would have undertaken it uh, with all of the thoroughness and thoughtfulness and del the deliberation that it requires. So first of all, congrats just for getting here uh, to you both. And I know lots and lots of work ahead. So I wish you uh, the best of luck. And obviously ACMI, we are planning to partner with you as best we can uh, to make sure that the education um, and information gets out uh, as broadly as possible. Uh, we stand here uh, ready to support you in every way we can. I have- Thanks very much, James. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Have, yes, thank you. Thank you both, sincerely. Um, so I have been speaking, you can see on your screen, or they were, uh, with Ken Pruitt, our town's energy manager, and Jenny Rate, the director of our Department of Planning and Community Development about the Net Zero Action Plan. As I mentioned earlier, it, it was a long episode, I get it, but man, this was really uh, information worth sharing and, uh, and you're going to be glad if you got to this point. So if you did, thanks for joining us. I'm James Milan, we'll see you next time.